so today we are going to discuss about the uh, imaging in pediatric stroke uh, and we'll be seeing some few case based uh, examples so uh, the scope of the today's session is that we'll be discussing which are the types of the pediatric strokes and uh, the imaging techniques and the recommended protocol we'll be discussing the case based discussion of various uh, etiologies and uh, with emphasis on the advanced neuroimaging we briefly talk about the stroke remix and then finally we'll conclude so basically the purpose of uh, imaging in pediatric stroke should be first of all to confirm the diagnosis and to assess any underlying cause we should exclude hemorrhage uh, and uh, the imaging also is useful for the uh, guiding treatment as well as to monitor the progression of the disease and uh, to differentiate mimicus from the uh, pediatric stroke and uh, in a pediatric population since the child uh, brain is immature the myelin is not uh, properly developed in less than 2 years uh, we should uh, do mri as the modality of choice instead of ct that should be the take home message from the uh, today's uh, session whenever it's possible uh, we should do mri as the modality of choice because that that is very useful uh, either confirm to refute the stroke possibility and to look for other causes as well which is not sometimes possible with the only doing ct scan so the pediatric stroke can be divided into arterial stroke hemorrhagic stroke and uh, dural venous sinus thrombosis related stroke uh, the interesting uh, thing about pediatric stroke is that there can be uh, many etiologies for one single stroke and uh, even sometimes a single episodes can be due to various factors leading to stroke so uh, multiple reasons can be there in pediatric strokes so uh, me uh, um, so the aoc and society they uh, are trying to formulate this kind of uh, imaging techniques and the what should be the uh, protocol and me and dr nihal ready we both were uh, doing some sort of homework and uh, coming up with the uh, guidelines uh, that which sequence is to be done in a suspected stroke so this 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 is the flow chart that we are trying to uh, propose that if the child if the clinically suspected stroke is there and uh, if the presentation is less than 6 hours and if you have uh, if you have possibility that mri is not available then you should do low dose ct scan with ct angiography and optionally you can do ct venogram uh, if you are suspecting venous sinus thrombosis so that's when uh, the mri is not immediately available uh, if mri is available uh, and there is no contraindication then you can we should do with uh, go ahead with the with the limited mri which includes the diffusion weighted images the swi that is the susceptibility weighted images uh, 3d tof uh, of cycle of felis brain and optional we can do the uh, 3d top of the neck uh, depending on the condition and uh, uh, there are certain optional sequences like axil t2 uh, then coronal flare if it is more than 2 years and uh, perfusion weighted images uh, based on the case scenario now if the child is coming after more than 6 hours so that we have lose that uh, uh, duration for uh, the uh, thrombolytic drugs so in that scenario we can do the dedicated uh, whole brain sequences which includes the diffusion weighted images swi t2 weighted axial flare coronal t2 uh, then 3d tof mra that is non contrast and or 3d uh, uh, phase contrast mri venogram to look for sinus thrombosis and uh, we should have one uh, t1 weighted 3d format so that we can uh, reconstruct the the uh, sequence in various uh, different planes now uh, there are certain scenario in which they will require some few uh, additional sequences for example if you are suspecting posterior circulation stroke or if you are looking for cervical trauma related section then we should also include t1 fat set neck uh, post contrast so that will be very useful to detection of those kind of scenario uh, we should do, uh, also includes the 3d tof of the neck uh, in in case of cardiac uh, disorders or arteriopathy or if you are dealing with the posterior circulation stroke or section we can use vessel wall imaging uh, if we are suspecting arteriopathies or vasculitis uh, we should uh, do uh, post cerebellum contrast when you are suspecting infection into stroke or if you are suspecting some sort of vascular malformation when you are doing the scan and you are looking to those kind of uh, imaging appearance uh, we we should do mr spectroscopy in, in certain stroke mimicers like uh, mitochondrial uh, in melas then we can do uh, mr spectroscopy and uh, ct also has got role uh, in in specific situation like mineralizing angiopathy that will be seen in a case example uh, we should uh, also do ct or mr venogram uh, both has got equal sensitivity and specificity as far as pediatric uh, population is concerned uh, even you are suspecting some sort of uh, deep venous territory in fact 
So, uh, starting with the arterial uh, ischemic stroke, we all know that, that there are a lot of causes for the arterial ischemic stroke which can be acquired like infection or genetic disorders. Uh, so, the arterial ischemic stroke is defined as acute focal neurological deficit which is consistent with the arterial ischemia. Uh, and uh, uh, CT can, and MRI can help only those kind of uh, diagnosis of the arterial ischemic stroke. So, uh, we'll, see, we'll be seeing some examples and uh, then I'll be discussing the role of each sequence or or role of advanced neuroimaging. So here is one uh, three-year-old child who came with history of uh, DURB, that is double outrate right ventricle, and the child had history of uh, pulmonary valvotomy two days back. And uh, on second post-operative day, the child had generalized seizures. So the MRI brain was suggested, in which uh, we can see that there was uh, diffuse uh, swelling and uh, hyperintensity involving the larger areas of the frontoparietal lobe, uh, which was also involving the uh, left, uh, left-sided basal ganglia. So it, so it was a large uh, MCA territory here, in fact, and here uh, the role of imaging is to diagnose the stroke and you have to see the extent of the stroke and uh, uh, you can see that there is some sort of midline shape also is there. Uh, so this kind of information we need to add uh, in our reports or we have to convey to the uh, clinician that very important that is there any midline shape or if is there any malignant infarct which is a larger territory infarct. Uh, and and uh, the next uh, uh, step should be to do MR angiogram of the brain and neck vessels. So it, these are the MR angiogram images in which we can see that the uh, the left-sided uh, ICA is not visualized from the, its origin only. This is the common carotid artery and we are not able to see the left-sided ICA. Uh, and even the intracranial portion of the left-sided ICA and its branches are not visualized. The left ICA is here is uh, uh, reformed by the opposite side circulation. So uh, it was looking like more of a occlusion of the left ICA from its origin. Uh, so in this kind of scenario, uh, Uh, looking at the images and uh, seeing the large areas of impact and uh, midline shift, it was decided that uh, decompressive uh, craniotomy was done. And uh, after uh, decompressive craniotomy, this is the follow-up image which shows that uh, the infected area now shows chronic transformation. And the uh, good thing is that there, is, there are no new areas of uh, impact in adjacent brain parenchyma. So we can salvage the rest of the brain uh, if we do timely decompression therapy. Moving on to the next uh, case, here is a six-year-old girl who was a third born of non consanguineous marriage and the patient had recurrent uh, history of uh, in past about uh, uh, neurological symptoms. Uh, uh, initially in 2.5 years of a child has uh, become some sort of unconscious epi episode and recently uh, the child had come with uh, left upper limb weakness for the last three months. And these are the uh, titubated axial images in which you can see that uh, it looks like more of a deep uh, watershed territory Chronic infarcts are there in terms of this kind of chronic cavitary lesions are there in the uh, in the central semi oval. You can also see that uh, areas of uh, volume loss and, and some sort of uh, uh, T2 hyperintensity involving the different parts of the brain. For example, here are the bilateral occipital lobe. This is the right uh, parietal area. So the child had recurrent uh, episodes of strokes in in past, uh, and these are looking like more of a chronic changes now. So the MRI angiogram image was showing that. Uh, there was a narrowing uh, of the bilateral ICA and uh, that we can see subsequent the right MCA uh, it's uh, on, on the right MCA shows poor caliber and, and uh, lesser branches as compared to the left side. And uh, that was the initial presentation. Uh, and then after follow-up, we can see that uh, the occlusion of the terminal ICA is more worsening. And you can see that uh, now uh, development of more and more collaterals, which we often label it as a puff of smoke appearance. Here we can see that the right MCA is not visualized. Uh, it, it is on showing some sort of progressive uh, narrowing. So this is looking like more of a uh, progressive condition which can be seen with vasculitis or more and more kind of syndrome. Uh, and uh, these are the few uh, images, uh, axial and the uh, sagittal images, in which we can see that uh, this is this is the uh, uh, the narrowing of the MCA and and, and narrowing of the bilateral terminal ICA, which can be seen on sagittal images. Just to show the normal MRN diagram, how it looks like, and uh, in our case, how is the uh, abnormality. And these are the some sort of source images. It's very important uh, to look at the source images because uh, sometimes the MRN diagram findings, uh, the reconstruction image may be misled us. So always look at the source images, which were showing this additionally uh, numerous collateral which has developed in the Sylvan feature and, and uh, in the basal systems because of the chronic uh, occlusion. So, uh, then uh, we also did uh, vessel wall imaging. 
so a uh, few words regarding vessel wall imaging so in vessel wall imaging we do uh, pet set images steamer related or it can be flare uh, and uh, we inject contrast and we try to look for the uh, the enhancement along the walls of the vessels we are not uh, interested what's happening into the lumen but if you want to see the wall enhancement then this is the uh, sequence especially when when you want to uh, uh, rule out or rule in infective or uh, inflammatory vasculitis as compared to genetic conditions then this is very useful in this case, case scenario uh, the vessel wall imaging was not showing any abnormal enhancement along the vessel wall a few examples of uh, moya moya syndrome uh, after the uh, after the surgery how it looks like so here is here is the post edam case in which we can see that uh, uh, the there is an anastomosis is done between the the branch of the right side eca that is the superficial temporal artery and and the the cortical bile uh, arteries of the uh, right side cerebral hemisphere and this anastomosis appears to be patent and you can see that the superficial branches are very well specified uh, on MR and geogram images. So just to be careful about how to interpret uh, the post edam uh, images, just to have an idea, I just wanted to show this image. The other thing, uh, in the case of Moyama disease or Moyama syndrome, uh, we, uh, we, we often do perfusion weighted images just to look at the look at the uh, the improvement after the surgery has been done and uh, whether the surgery is beneficial or not. Uh, that we can do by uh, checking at uh, various parameters. Out of that, uh, we should always uh, look at the MTT and TTP in a case of Moyama disease. So uh, uh, generally, uh, in, a, in a case of Moyama disease, uh, you will have this kind of increased MTT and TTP that indicate that uh, the time to peak and mean transit time is increasing in those kind of scenario because it's a chronic hypoperfuse uh, brain area which will show this kind of strong uptake, strong color. Uh, greenish or reddish color, which indicates that increased value of the FTT and TTP. Uh, and, and this value should decrease over time. That should be uh, uh, after the surgery that we should see on follow-up images. And, and uh, when you are doing personal beta images, the, the machine should be standard in the same machine because uh, different machine will have different values and uh, it, it varies uh, depending on the in uh, how, how, uh, how much flow rate you are injecting contrast. And, and other variables. So uh, always start to try to do uh, the function between in the single center where you have done the previous imaging. Here is one example of uh, a child with sickle cell uh, disease. Uh, we all know that sickle cell uh, disease has role of transcranial Doppler. Uh, and uh, here are the images of the transcranial Doppler in which we can see that uh, the right MCA doesn't show any uh, uh, good arterial flow, but the left MCA was patent. And the child had this kind of uh, deep internal water territory infarct. Uh, and this, this infarct can be silent, and uh, which is known as silent cerebral ischemia. And uh, uh, especially in a case of uh, uh, this kind of occlusion, you will see this kind of leptomegal circle hyperintensity, which indicates, uh, which is also known as uh, IV sign. And uh, this patient had uh, occlusion of the right side MCA, as we can see here. So uh, sickle cell disease, uh, basically, uh, it usually affects the terminal ICA, proximal AC and MCA. That is, these are the common area uh, of the sickle cell vasculopathy. And uh, we should uh, we should do uh, regularly the uh, transclade Doppler. Uh, and uh, there are various values out there. If it is more than 200 uh, centimeter per second in the MCA, that is definitely abnormally high velocity and uh, the child should get imaged MRI. Uh, so it's a very good uh, screening utility that we should perform. Then uh, here is one of the uh, condition that uh, uh, as a resident, as a PG, you should be aware about that in a children, when a child comes with uh, with recent history of fever uh, or, or, or past history of some sort of uh, viral infection like varicella and the patient comes with sudden onset stroke-like symptoms. And when you do imaging, uh, you will see, especially in this case scenario, uh, there was an infarct in the right side, quadrant nucleus and the putamen. And uh, uh, on MRI angiogram, we could see that there was narrowing of the uh, right side uh, MCA. So this was looking like some sort of uh, transient cerebral arteriopathy. Uh, but to label uh, any pathology as transient cerebral arteriopathy, uh, you should do follow-up imaging. And uh, the follow-up imaging was done after six months. And image, we can see that uh, the vessel had become normal and there were no new areas of impact. So uh, this was a classical case of uh, post varicella transient angiopathy, uh, which we often see. And uh, uh, and so you should now uh, uh, differentiate between the transient cerebral arteriopathy versus the chronic cerebral arteriopathy. So uh, the transient cerebral arteriopathy uh, usually will not show will not show any progression uh, after six months of follow up. But however, if you are seeing any progression of the arteriopathy, progression of the narrowing in the MR angiogram, 
then you should label that condition as a chronic cerebral arteriopathy. So when you are initially imaging, that's a provisional diagnosis because you don't know uh, what will happen after uh, on the follow-up scan. And usually these uh, TCA, they are the focal and monophasic and often present with the basal and glass stroke. So that you should keep in mind. Uh, here is another uh, example of uh, transient cerebral arteriopathy. Just wanted to show you that uh, uh, vessel wall imaging. So here we perform the vessel wall imaging and we could see this kind of uh, focal areas of circumference enhancement in the distal MCA in this element fissure. So uh, that was positive and uh, this patient also uh, came out to be uh, vessel infection positive on, on uh, investigation. Uh, here is the example. Uh, sometimes... Uh, uh, not sometimes it's not uncommon that TB can present with uh, with a stroke like uh, symptoms and and on imaging you will see this kind of uh, uh, hydrocephalus and significant uh, enhancement along the basal cistern and sylvian fissure. Uh, since uh, this basal accelerates and uh, sylvian fissure enhancement can compress the vessels and that can cause this kind of small vessel infarcts. Uh, for example, here we can see infarcts in the right side uh, basal ganglia. Uh, and uh, the same patient, what you can see here, the uh, MR angiogram finding, which is showing narrowing and irregularity of the bilateral line MCA. And uh, this is that vessel wall imaging in which we can see that enhancement along the walls of the bilateral uh, MCA. So that is positive. Uh, uh, that indicates that uh, the cause of uh, etiology is either infection or inflammatory. And subsequently, we can guide our clinician. Uh, not all uh, conditions are. Uh, are uh, acquired. There are certain uh, genetic conditions also which can uh, come with stroke-like episodes and uh, uh, as, and few conditions are there in which if you are seeing some classic imaging finding then you can uh, you can raise the possibility uh, of genetic art, uh, arteriopathy leading to stroke. So here is one example in which uh, we can see that uh, uh, the flare image is showing some sort of uh, deep water state territory uh, uh, ischemic changes. And uh, the MR angiogram findings are classical. Here you can see that uh, there is a straightening of the uh, intracranial vessels. And uh, but in contrary to where you are not able, you are not seeing uh, the puff of smoke kind of uh, collaterals. And uh, you are seeing some sort of dilated uh, ICA uh, both sides. So when you see this kind of classical uh, uh, MR angiogram finding, then you can raise a suspicion of this entity. This entity also can have uh, some sort of uh, dysplastic looking brain. For example, here is dysplasia of the corpus sclerosum and the brainstem, and you will see uh, the abnormal gyration pa pattern. And since the the gene here is also involving the smooth muscle, now you can have this kind of uh, dilatation of the aortic root. So uh, this is this uh, condition is known as ectatic mutation that you should be known that because the imaging findings are very classical and you can raise the possibility. Uh, then uh, there are certain conditions which can affect uh, in utero also. And uh, they can manifest uh, uh, in the postnatal imaging as a, as a chronic uh, infarcts and, and sometimes in a porent cephalic cyst. Uh, so here is an example of left-sided uh, periventricular infarct with porent cephalic cyst. And, uh, and you can see that uh, infarct also involving the right side putamen. Uh, and uh, so, so when you see that uh, it's involving predominantly the small vessels, uh, so that is the call for a mutation can cause this kind of... Uh, in utero or antenatal infarcts that you should uh, come bear in mind. This uh, patient sometimes can have hemorrhage also that you should be aware about. So when you are seeing this kind of uh, larger portocaphalic cyst uh, hemorrhage uh, in, without any uh, underlying obvious cause or any antenatal risk factor, then you might be dealing with the call, call for a one mutation. Uh, sometimes uh, certain dis genetic disorder can uh, mimic on imaging like a stroke like condition in which the clinical uh, history and, and the clinical examination is very useful. For example, here is one child, one year, one month old child uh, who were resident of Kerala, and uh, and the uh, on examination there were coarse hypopigmented curly hairs that you can see here, uh, and these are the uh, MRI images in which we can see the stroke-like lesions in the left side occipital lobe, and uh, you are seeing this kind of tortuosity of the vessels. So this kind of tortuosity of the vessels uh, and and stroke-like lesions uh, and involvement of the basal ganglia and other part of the brain. That is a bit uh, classical clinical examination can give a clue that this is looking like a man case disease, uh, which is like disturbance of the copper metabolism. So uh, this kind of imaging uh, tortuosity vessels with clinical examination makes a lot of difference uh, uh, in, in evaluation of the child with uh, stroke like lesions. So uh, a few facts regarding the genetic uh, causes of the vasculitis. So first of all, uh, the term arteriopathy implies in C2 arterial abnormality that is not attributable to the exogenous traumas and not considered a normal variant. 
Uh, and you should be knowing that uh, the same genetic mutation can have different uh, imaging phenotypes, for example, NF1. Uh, and there are several uh, genes which can cause Moyama syndrome, like for example, NF1, JAK1, uh, ELN, and, and so and so. Uh, but certain uh, genes have characteristic imaging finding, for example, ECTA2, what we saw, and uh, Fabry's disease, which can have T1 hyperintensity of the corvina. And uh, all four A1 and A2 mutation, they can cause venous and arterial infarcts. So just keep in mind that there are genetic causes also are there which can cause uh, stroke formation. Uh, then uh, here is another uh, classical uh, uh, case of uh, Bo Hunter syndrome. So whenever the child comes with uh, Bo serious circulation stroke, you should first of all uh, always look at carefully about the CV junction because uh, it has been shown that uh, many a time uh, without any risk factor, but uh, the if the child is having some sort of CV junction abnormality, whether congenital or acquired, that can lead to stroke. Uh, by comparison of the vertebral artery and that can uh, be a presentation. For example, here we are seeing that uh, left-sided pons here are showing uh, acute stroke and uh, when MR angiogram was done, it was showing this narrowing of the basal artery. Uh, and CT angiogram, uh, when you are you are seeing uh, head turning to the one side and the other side, you are seeing that narrowing in different part of the vertebral artery uh, and, and this is the classical finding in, uh, in a case of Bo Hunter syndrome uh, when turning to the uh, one side will cause uh, narrowing of the affected vessels and that can lead to this kind of stroke that we have uh, seen here. Uh, a special mention to the uh, Dr. Astik Bifas and Dr. Prakash who has provided this case. Then uh, uh, here is one other uh, classical condition which often comes to our, us uh, in clinics that 14-month-old uh, boy with history of fall with while playing, child doesn't have any history of uh, uh, any history, a prior history of uh, illness or sickness, the child was playing and had a fall. And uh, then followed by uh, there was weakness of the upper limbs, right side upper limbs. And what we saw here that there was acute infarct involving the left side glutamate. And if you see carefully, there was uh, a small chronic infarct also noted in the left side of the glutamate. Uh, the MR angiogram are classically normal uh, in this kind of scenario. Uh, and uh, in this, when you see, uh, we are, when you are seeing basal just stroke, and uh, the MR angiogram is negative and no other risk factor of vascularity or infection, uh, then even though your susceptibility weighted images are, are negative, they are not showing calcification, you should do limited CT scan uh, uh, to, look, to look for this entity which is called as mineralizing endopathy. So uh, we did the CT scan and here we can see that uh, linear calcification along the branches of the lenticulostriate territory uh, in bilateral MCA. So that indicative of uh, basal calcification. Uh, so this is the mineralizing angiopathy of childhood, uh, in which uh, in which uh, we can see that uh, uh, like uh, sometimes these mechanical forces uh, they cause this rapid brain displacement, which is causing stretching of the vessels, and that leads to the, uh, this mineralizing angiopathy of childhood, which is more common in six months to uh, twenty four months, because in infancy the angle between the uh, the MC and the lenticulostriate and uh, arteries are acute, so that is prone for uh, development of this condition. Uh, it's very important to diagnose this condition because it will, uh, it, it's very, very good response with the aspirin and uh, the prognosis is very good uh, with intensive therapy. And we can obviate the other extensive workup for the stroke uh, in this kind of scenario. Uh, here is one example of uh, dissection in which uh, the child had uh, inf uh, uh, recurrent infarct in the left side of the cerebral hemisphere. And as we have noted uh, before that uh, we should uh, do vessel wall imaging and we should uh, do the T1 fat set post contrast images. Uh, it's very uh, difficult to diagnose dissection on the uh, MR angiogram or MRI images. But if you are lucky enough if you, and if you do dedicated this kind of T1 fat set images, you can see uh, focal circumferential enhancement and the uh, intimal flap within that area, which is like diagnostic of uh, dissection. Uh, then moving forward, uh, now uh, moving to the hemorrhagic stroke. So there are certain uh, vascular lesions or clotting disorders or drugs can lead to hemorrhagic stroke. Uh, the good thing about hemorrhagic stroke is that uh, the positive factor can be found in 75% of the cases. And uh, here is one of the examples in which the child had come with uh, stroke-like symptoms. And uh, on imaging, we could see that uh, the child had multiple cavernomas. You can see that the popcorn kind of lesions involving the right side peritonic area as well as right side of the uh, pons. Uh, and, and the peritonic area shows this kind of uh, high point and staining or uh, blushing, which indicates that there is some sort of bleed in this location. So that's why the patient had uh, uh, some sort of recurrent sensory uh, impairment in uh, which is involving the post-central gyrus. Uh, 
so it's very important on this kind of uh, etiology can be uh, easily uh, diagnosed on MRI. And this was a multiple cavernoma, which was uh, giving like to stroke-like symptoms. Then, uh, and moving on to the last uh, variety, that is the dural venous sinus thrombosis. So, uh, dural venous sinus thrombosis, they have uh, different uh, risk factor in different age group. For example, in neonatal age group, uh, the birth trauma or hypoxia are the more common ones. Uh, or uh, metal infection or dehydration can lead to uh, venous sinus thrombosis. In child or adolescent age group, uh, the, you should be looking for nephrotic syndrome or prothrombotic stage. And there are certain uh, scenarios which will affect the, which can lead to the uh, dural venous sinus thrombosis in all ages. For example, uh, chemotherapy or cancer like uh, acute lipoplastic leukemia, anemia, and so on. So here is one uh, case scenario in which a 10 year old girl who had come with sudden onset headache and hemiparesis on the left side of the body and uh, we could see that the child was having uh, this kind of uh, infarct which was involving the right uh, deep protracted territory as well as left sided perirundic region. Uh, the important thing to note is that uh, when you should, on T2-weighted images, the sagittal sinus should show this kind of, uh, uh, it should show void, it should be black or hypointense in nature, but when you see this kind of hyperintensity and distension, that indicates it's an abnormal thing. And, uh, and corresponding different weighted images are showing uh, this, uh, uh, marked distension of the sinuses as well as cortical weights and which are showing uh, restricted diffusion. So that was highly suspicious for dural venous sinus thrombosis. And uh, these are the post contrast images which shows that filling defect in the uh, sinuses as well as in the cortical weights. Uh, and uh, on T1 weighted images on pre contrast, you are seeing T1 hyper intensity. Uh, since there is a blo blockage of the uh, dural venous sinuses, the medullary veins were engorged. And that's why we are seeing uh, much more uh, SWI hypo intensity as compared to normal uh, uh, image that you can compare and see that there's significant obstruction which is leading to dilated medullary veins. Uh, here is the case in which all the practically all the dual venous iris were, were obliterated and uh, we show, and especially uh, the the uh, facial veins and, and the extracerebral veins have opened up and trying to uh, drainage the uh, brain circulation. And here is the example of normal anatomy of the how the dural venous sinus should look like, right? Uh, finally, just a few words regarding the stroke mimickers. Uh, there are certain conditions which can clinically mimic like a stroke, like for example, nailas or or press or sometimes familial hemorrhagic migraine and MRI is very useful. So here's one example in which a 14 years old child had come with a clustered seizure at presentation. But at presentation, we could see only the dorsal tegmental showing this kind of symmetrical hyperintensity. And the child again had a, had a, another episode of left side numbness, significant paraphysia. And what we could see at that time that swelling of the bilateral parieto temporal region, which were not following any any arterial territory. Uh, there was not much restriction, only few uh, areas of the swollen area was showing uh, restricted different, but rest of the uh, area were not showing restricted different. Uh, so uh, it was not typically fitting with any arterial or venous territory stroke. Uh, and MR spectroscopy was done based on the clinical suspicion and uh, and uh, it was showing this kind of large lactate peak at 1.3 ppm. So that was uh, confirmatory or that was giving uh, confidence in, in uh, raising possibility of mitochondrial disease. Uh, sometimes perfusion weighted image is also very useful when you uh, are assessing, when you are not sure whether you are dealing with the stroke or whether you are dealing with uh, inflammatory conditions like autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, so in an acute phase of autoimmune encephalitis, uh, it, it should show increased perfusion which is indicated by this kind of red and uh, green color. Uh, uh, here was a case scenario in which there was a clinical dilemma uh, about amongst the neurologists that whether they are, we are dealing with the stroke or we are dealing with the, with the fresh episode of uh, NM, anti-NMDR receptor positive autoimmune in which the virtual embedded image is help, helped. So to conclude, periodic stroke is an important cause of morbidity and mortality. And uh, appropriate usage of imaging often helps in confirming the stroke and uh, potential etiological cases in certain scenario. And uh, MRI is uh, definitely a very good tool to differentiate stroke from the stroke in many conditions. Uh, by that, I would like to conclude the sessions and thank you, thank you for the opportunity.